Hustle is actually on Tubi. Mm. I mean, Ebony Hustle 2, the role was actually um, given to Mama D, Scrappy's mom. Oh, wow. And the lead actress was like, I can't work with her. She's coming in with the entourage. She's like acting a dang blank fool. And the lead actress was like, I'm not doing it. And they were like, we're in production. What do you want us to do? She said, call Laura Poindexter. So I, I'm, I'm excited about that. And I have a, um, a one that is going to be my first uh, film noir, mm -hmm. black and white. Um, just the content is very eclectic. So I'm waiting for that. And what else? Do, those are the two that I'm ha I have waiting to come out. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, but I got tons of stuff. Um, Netflix, I'm on Netflix. Um, what? Yeah, uh, Killer Mike's Trigger Warning. Um, Amazon Prime, I play a judge in To A Moral Certainty. So, I, yeah, my actress credits is I got like, like, gangs of, of movies that I've been in that's on Tubi. Like, Do you, what, is your, what is your role that you go to? Like, yeah, I'm, I can kill this role. Like, what is your role that you... Alpha female. Mm -hmm. Alpha female and it doesn't. I I can do go from grandmom to mom, to auntie. I am looking for roles though that um, challenge a softer side of me, mm -hmm. to pull a softer side of me. I I don't look at. I don't have the fear of being typecast because at my age I just want to work. Mm -hmm. So if I get the roles and I can kill them, but yeah, alpha female. Wow, that's that's great. That's yeah, good. Uh, we running. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are back in here. This is another episode. I'm sorry, I said episode. This is another <laughs> episode. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, guys. This is another episode, a beautiful episode, and an episode that I'm excited for, the $20 million podcast. And today, we have the one and only, the soul writer, Laura Poindexter. Hey, thank you for having me. That's great, that's great. <laughs> I, was, I ain't gonna lie, I was, when I woke up this morning, I was already thinking, like, what is the intro? I'm, I, was, I thought, like, four different intros. Really? And I, when I got here, I blinked. Okay. We're like family now. Yeah, I'm, oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm a little, you, you know I'm tired, right? Yes. You know I'm tired. We, we rap. What time did we rap last night? About, like, 10. About 10 o'clock. Went to sleep. I had to get up. I still have not. The house is still. It still looks like we were filming, but I have a lot of things to do. And I'm when I bounce from here, I'm gonna see family, and then I'm out to Austin for another television show. I'm a little tired, but I'm still happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So what's 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 your uh, what's your daily what's your daily routine when you wake up in the morning? Oh wow, my daily routine is to pray that my dog. It's not saying, take me out right now, take me out right now. <laughs> that never, ever happens. I usually um, take my dog for a walk. I do coffee. I, I sleep with, with scripture all through the night. I sleep with scripture. And um, when I get up, I say my prayers. I, I like being in a grateful place and not allowing what I physically, what we physically have to do and pay the bills and go to work and da da da. I understand that my higher power gives me everything I need to do those things. So it's very important for me to first acknowledge the source. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I fall short. Sometimes I stop in the middle and say, like, oh my goodness, I didn't even thank you. So my routine really is getting up, being grateful mm -hmm. for what it is and not, not having my mind think about all of the many things that I need to do. That gratefulness mm -hmm. and starting there really helps me to go through my day, no matter how much it is, like, in order. Oh, wow, that's yeah. great, okay, okay, great. So you say, you say you pray, you pray every morning. <gasps> We're gonna have to start all over again, right? No, we don't, it's okay. We don't? We, 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 this is gonna be on the podcast? My bad. It's not live, we're good. Okay, so you're gonna edit it out. get your phone for you? Cut, yeah, get it and cut it off, I put it. Uh, I was about to ask you a question. Okay. So I'll pick up over there. My bad, I'm so Let sorry. Let me know running. Okay, so you say in the morning that you pray. Um, what is if uh, it's a lot of? Of course, there's a lot of young people that watch. That's that's not that's not too familiar. Well, if you had to tell somebody three main things to pray about. Hmm, that's a really good question. Three main things to pray about. The first thing would be to pray that you will always stay connected. Right, life is busy. We're always 
getting alerts, ping, zing, buzz, likes, follows. Life is always commanding our attention away from the source. My, my first thing to tell anybody is pray that you stay connected with the source because life is busy. The second thing I would say is to remember to pray for somebody else. Mm. Don't allow your prayers to be selfish. There is something that um, is powerful about being in whatever you're in and still finding it within yourself to care about somebody else. Mm. The third thing I would say is that pray that you will always be grateful. We live in a world that says you are not enough. It is. We always want more. Mm -hmm. In wanting more, you step outside of being grateful for what you have. There is a scripture, and I, I, I'm good at quoting scriptures, but I can't tell you where they are. But even in the Bible, it says, to the less they have, less to the more you have more. The more is not ne necessarily from a substance. Mm -hmm. The more is in spirit. Mm -hmm. When your spirit is strong, you can stand against anything. So first thing is to pray to be Connected. The second thing is to pray for someone else. else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the third would be pray that you're always grateful. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that, helped, that helped me out. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, talk about more so how has, I don't know, if you don't have to talk about this, if you don't want to talk about, you, you've, you, you've, you've lived a life, a great one. Talk about your relationship with Christianity this whole time. I'm from a little girl. How do you feel like you talk about your relationship? Okay. Um, before I talk about my relationship, I I just want to say this. I I I'm very I'm confused about growing up in a world that has now expanded. Um, they they don't want to label it. Everybody's spiritual, mm -hmm. right? And I get that. But I tell people quite simply. You better name the spirit. Identify the spirit. Christianity for me, like many young Christians growing up in a, a, a household of color, I had a religion relationship with God. That's what I was taught. How to go to church and pray and good Sunday and, 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 and we went to Sunday school and we went to prayer service on Wednesday but life challenged me to have a relationship with God. In my relationship with God, in as much as I would like to be angry with somebody who does something wrong, I can't. Mm. In a relationship with God, you want to abide in peace with all men. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm an OG. You come at me. I'm coming back at you. That's when I was in religion. Mm. In relationship with God, he breaks you down. I'm too busy with him showing me. And every time God shows me me, I understand how small I am in the equation. Oh, wow. That humility helps me to work on being a better me. And if I'm a better me, then I can be a better me for you. In religion, mm. it's different. Okay. Relationship with God. When you go to God, God says, okay, I understand, but I fight your battles. You're supposed to rise above that because you are going to always be an example of me. No matter what happens, no matter what you have to be an example of me and he, make no bones about it. He knows that's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. That's why he says, I give you the strength. Mm. That's great. I can't do this in my flesh. No, so, can't. yeah, relationship with God. I'm, I'm walking some days. I'm, I'm 
good, some days not so good, but that's the glory of God. He says, every day I give you new mercy. In the morning when you wake up, whatever you did or didn't do yesterday, you're covered under the blood. Acknowledge it and do better today. Mm-hmm. Nothing can compare to my God. Oh, let me be clear. I'm talking about Jesus. <laughs> just yes, in case. Yeah, okay. I just in case. You know, we, that gets kind of yeah. convoluted. Yeah. Yes, it okay. does. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> for, some, for some of you, for some of you, it's probably your first time hearing of Miss Laura. Um, is for me it was it was new she it was it was it was new to me she was new to me and since meeting her it's just like it's like getting sucked into a world that it's just like it's it's like <laughs> i'm in a whole different world now and it's and it's and it's like i and and it's and i'm grateful for it i'm grateful for you too i'm gonna ask him some questions now oh wow <laughs> i'm ready so we're talking and i'm potentially interviewing you to um come in as a cinematographer for the film that we just finished wrapping here in Baltimore. Mm. And I say to you, okay, I'm gonna give you a shot, right? But you got 24 hours to get back in contact with me. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. He got back in contact with me in 27 hours and I had already booked somebody, <laughs> right? But I, I looked at his stuff and research is really people and especially in the industry. Research is important. I looked at his stuff. I was impressed by his stuff. So I said, hey, I got an offer. Kind of like the God, Godfather. I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> and so he came on set, hung out with me and my crew, took amazing, amazing pictures. I think you were able in four hours to get upwards of 360 candid shots with less than a 24-hour turnaround, your girl was impressing. It ain't easy to impress Miss Laura, okay? <laughs> so, and then that snowballed into you coming and actually doing some videography. Mm-hmm. And um, how do you feel about getting your first IMDb credits in a feature film? It feels great. It feels <laughs> great. I was, me, me, me and her have been, for the past... I don't know how long we've been talking about how bad I've been wanting to get in the film. Um, and and it's just like, I guess God heard us, you know? He definitely did. And I and um, I mean, I prayed on it, you know? And it's just it's just like every time he delivers, you know? I think that, that for you, he delivered at, at like, like he really did his God thing. Because a lot of times when you when you are trying to get into a new aspect, so you do podcasting. So when we're in the industry, we want to kind of get our feet wet and everything to see what we really like. Mm-hmm. A lot of times we go on sets and we work for free for the experience. God did his God thing because you came in out of the gate being paid for your services. And to for me, that's him saying, you don't, you, you come in now and say, nope, I've had the experience. And, and and I'm really happy about that for you. I'm excited for both of you guys. And um, I'm excited to work with you some more and, and see what God has in store for you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited too. Um, let's get back to the Miss Lord interview okay. now. Get back to the Miss Lord <laughs> interview. Um, if somebody, if, if this, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the viewers here, they probably never heard about you. So if you had to break yourself down in about three sentences, um, to a stranger. Three sentences. Dang, that's hard. Okay. Um. Mm, my name is Laura Poindexter, and I am a creative survivor who loves giving back to the community. Did I do it in three? I, you know, I knew how to you add my add-ons, the and and the buts and yeah. the yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody, that's nobody ever knows how. Nobody ever answers that question. That's a that's a that's a dope question, uh-huh. but it's like that's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't really understand three sentences and how to carry it on. <laughs> that's probably because I interview a lot of like rappers and stuff, but okay, I'm not gonna blame them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, talk to me about your early stages and in getting into film. Like, what was going on in, in t- What was going on around your life around that um, time when you're getting into film that made you want to get into film? Well, it it was a gradual process. I didn't actually start in film. I started um, as a poet. Believe it or not, I worked here in Maryland for 23 years, health and human services. That was my love. I'm under the impression I'm going to retire. I loved helping people. I loved helping my community. I would have never stopped. So he had to take it from me to give me this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's going on? He was like, let me tell you what's going on. And it was like, to hear the audible voice of God. Something that we've never experienced. To audibly hear God is life changing. When he told me that I was coming to Atlanta, I was broke. You're taking everything from me. I didn't know where I was gonna stay. I didn't have a job, I didn't have a plan. And that was the first time that I had fully operated on faith as in Peter walking on the water, faith. I came to Atlanta, I started um, getting extra roles. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't doing extra roles, I was cleaning toilets. Because I knew if I applied for a job, that job would be a nine to five, I would have to follow their rules, but I wouldn't be open to whatever this thing God was doing and because God wasn't telling me, he said, if I tell you everything, then you're not operating in faith. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you what you need to know, when you need to know it, and that's all you're going to get. And I started getting more extra roles and I started to kind of like master the the extra role space. And um, I my first opportunity speaking role, shout out to Bobby Huntley in ATL. Bobby Huntley's got next doing great things. Bobby gave me my first speaking role. Mm-hmm. And the rest was history. I thought that acting would be my primary, but if I had to break it down, it would definitely be producer because that fits with what I did. I like bringing all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Producer, director, screenwriter, actress would be at at the bottom. And so that's how I started. In 2016, I packed whatever I could fit in my largest suitcase. I took a 24-hour bus ride to Atlanta, Georgia. I had $32 in my pocket. From Atlanta, from... I'm sorry, from Baltimore, Maryland, to Atlanta. And I was just like, okay, God. Wow. Talk about some of the first things you did when you landed in Atlanta with that 34? What? When 34 what? Dollars. 32. What was your first thing you did when you landed? (laughs) I mean, when you arrived? I had some friends in Atlanta because I had gone come out to Atlanta. And the first thing I did was promise people, if you let me sleep on your couch... I'm, a, I'm gonna do this because now watch this. If I was 18 or 17 or even 27, mm-hmm. I was 50 years old. People are like, you sure you just don't wanna go up? Walmart is hiring, Laura. Right down the street. You sure that this is what you wanna do? I was like, listen, it's this, this, you know, begging, pleading, and in one year, I think I was bounced around to different places because everything was inconsistent. 
I've got some consistency near the last of my first year. Wow. I can't, I can't blur this out. It happens. Right. Yeah. Okay, welcome back. We are um, awfully apologetic. Is that the right word to use? Apologetic. I am very apologetic because of technical difficulties. Um, this particular brand in my cord <laughs> isn't the best for you up and coming creators. <laughs> but we're going to go back to this wonderful interview and we're going to blame the court and the <laughs> devil for the <laughs> So, okay, Miss Laura, talk about your first year going to Atlanta with that $32 in your pocket. The first year in Atlanta sucked. Okay. It just sucked because I was talking about this huge, big aspiration to people who really, you're blessed when you have an aspiration and a dream. You got to understand how blessed you are. So, um, sidebar, whatever you're dreaming to become, you're special. You got to get surrounded by people who believe in that. I was surrounded by people who was like, look, you got to pay bills. You got to buy food. You got to. And so my first year sucked. Um, before I got that, that first role that I spoke about, right? I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to land a living gig. I, I worked with disabled people. I lived there, and that is the first place that I got my footing. Mm -hmm. But my first year sucked. My second year sucked a little less. And my third year sucked even less than that. And then by the fourth year, I had got my footing, you know, and things started to get better, mm -hmm. you know. Um, talk about some... Talk about do you, do you think do you, did you grow any new habits moving to Atlanta like anything you started doing that you did weren't doing in Baltimore that you couldn't do? Yeah, absolutely. Enjoying all of the landscape. I'm I'm an urban girl. I'm from New York to Baltimore. I moved to Georgia. This is the first time I ever see things that say 150 acres for sale, 200 acres for sale. You know, this is the first time that I'm actually, I've seen horses, I've seen cows, I've traveled domestically growing up. But to live right down the street and my neighbor has this like four or five acre cattle ranch. Mm. So what I started to do that I've never done before is to acknowledge and appreciate nature. Mm. That's yeah. That's great. Um, you said, you said you grew up in New York originally. Yeah, how Harlem long, in the building, baby. How long, <laughs> what, what age did you come to Baltimore? I was 21 years old when I moved to Baltimore. Mm. Yep, I was a um, new mother, and I actually moved to Baltimore because in New York I was addicted to crack cocaine. Mm. My family from Baltimore came to visit. They offered me, they said, come on back, and I was like, no, I'm not doing it, I'm not having it. They came back and had a family meeting, and when they came back, they basically said, we know that you don't want to go, but you're going. Mm -hmm. Thank you to my Baltimore family. Thank you. <laughs> talk about, um, is it okay if we talk about a living your life in Harlem? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, talk about, what, what you, said, you said you were addicted in Harlem. Talk about, what was your what was your day-to-day -day routine then like? So, um, uh, f just just to give a little backstory, um, Everybody, everybody knows what Harlem is, right? So in the, the Great Migration, when African Americans would migrate from the South to the North for a better life, they stopped in Chicago and in certain places, right? Harlem was one of those places. And um, it was a great place for African Americans to open businesses, to keep the dollar within the community, um, and to have just like this, this sense of self-worth that they had not experienced before. And so my grandmother and my grandfather migrated from Richmond, Virginia, had my, my father and my uncle, my dad had me. And it was, a, it was a great community. It was really a great community. We kept our doors open. You could go to your neighbor and say, hey, my grandmother needs flour, hey, somebody. It, it was great. I have to also say that we were poor but we didn't know that we were poor because we were rich in the things that were important. Mm -hmm. We valued each other. We nourished each other. Um, and seemingly our communities, 
are plagued with with things and and um, crack cocaine was not the first thing that plagued our community. Um, or around the '60s, around uh, the Vietnam War, nearing the end, we had a lot of of veterans, African American veterans, come back addicted to heroin, and um, our communities, not just Harlem, black communities were flooded with heroin. And so I, before I became addicted, I was able to look at my uncle, my father's brother. He was a heroin addict, and I knew other people who were heroin, heroin addicts. And so you would think that that would, of course, make me afraid, right? And, and so there, there was some fear associated with it, but if you see it often enough, you become numb to it. I didn't start um, with crack cocaine. I started with powdered cocaine. Um, my boyfriend, I was 14, my boyfriend was 19, and he was a neighborhood drug dealer. Oh, wow. And um, the first time I did cocaine was at a Rick James concert. Rick James? Yes, I will never forget it. And Charlie Murphy is right. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Okay. <laughs> cocaine is a hell of a drug. Okay, Rick James, cocaine is a hell of a drug. And, and I had been experiencing um, just a lot of a trauma from the loss of my mother and that. That occurred when I was five years old. Okay. I didn't do therapy. Um, I didn't work through that trauma. And so when I did cocaine, cocaine made me forget about everything painful, anything bad. You know, it made me feel like I was a super person. And uh, soon thereafter, um, I would begin to smoke um, crack cocaine. Yeah, I was actually smoking crack cocaine when Richard Pryor was smoking crack cocaine. I just have one question. Yeah. Where, where, when nobody was smoking weed, it was just... Yeah, people were smoking weed, but it, it I don't know. I can only just talk about it from my point of view. And we see all of these documentaries about the crack epidemic I'm going to say that that was a pandemic. Mm. Heroin was a pandemic yes, because when you look at it, just just is it just a crazy that a 14 year old is smoking crack? Yes, but I wasn't the only 14 year old smoking crack, mm. right? The laws that were instituted for possession and use of that drug really created this, if the crack didn't get you, the time that you would serve in jail for using or distributing would. And so I, I was just a part of this thing that, that came in and ravaged the community. And people always say, well, you went to Baltimore, uh, you know, they were smoking crack in Baltimore too. By that time, I was ready to stop and I was a mom. The love for my son was more powerful than my addiction to the to the drug, mm. yeah. And was it was it ever a point? I'm sorry, I'm gonna get off the weed. But it was it ever a point where you tried weed and it, it wasn't it did it did wasn't when it wasn't good enough? Yeah, well, I, I smoked weed. Re remember, I'm in Harlem. Hip hop had had just come out. We were smoking weed, dancing in the park. Busy B, Starsky, Mary J. Blige did Real Love right in the park, right across the street from what? where I live. What? Like, yeah, oh yeah, God, you nice. know. But even when we were filming, you saw I had a picture of Billie Holiday. Yes. Like I lived in Harlem, in in from a cultural perspective, Harlem is the cultural mecca. Dapper Dan, like Dapper Dan was styling for hustlers before he was styling for LL Cool J in the rap. Like wow. Dapper Dan now is a, is a a fashion national treasure. Mm -hmm. Like Gucci, Dapper Dan now is affiliated with Gucci, but before then, like I'm from Harlem, don't you know? So I enjoyed all of, all of those things, but there has to be a point in your life where directionally, you're focused. Mm. So outside of hanging out and smoking weed and you know posing in pictures, you have to have a focus and that focus has to be more important than everything else. And what happens in the inner city is that we become inundated with the 
exterior stuff. It is what's in us that propels us forward. What's outside of us entertains us. And in most cases, it distracts us. I was hella distracted. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Tom, you said you were 21 when you came to Baltimore. Yes. Um, talk about some of the first thing you did when you first got to Baltimore. I know you, you, you said you said you were forced to move. So I know you wasn't you really didn't want to go. So probably so. I moved in with my aunt who was a pastor. Uh-huh. Do I need to say anything else? I went to church for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. <laughs> I went to church for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and I learned how to be a mom. I learned how to take care of myself and my son. I learned how to live life on life's terms, and I stumbled and I bumbled through that because drugs are reliable in the fact that they do what they say they're going to do. They get you high. Life is unpredictable. Mm. And the unpredictability of life is what I had a problem with. And I had to understand that life was not going to change, which meant that I had to. Mm. So I was learning how to change and live life on life's terms and try to figure out what I wanted to do and, 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 and try to find confidence when you come out of this this fog and this haze and who you are was a part of what everybody said you should be and attached to the clothes that you wear and like like just finding out who I was and loving that loving me you know Recently, I'm not gonna throw any shade, but oh man, I just man, I I watch off the beaten path stuff. I'm always on PBS, like um, public television always gives me really good. Stuff.
and and so I I cloning, I thought that it was a lot of truth shrouded in in comedy. I enjoyed it a, a lot, especially since Jamie Foxx had the, that thing that he had that whatever that thing was. So they cloned him too. Okay, so and then you know. Someone or he will send me someone and they will have an amazing story and I will tell that story because there are a lot of stories that need to be told so I and I love documentary it gives you this you have like room mm -hmm. with a documentary so something that's scripted and everything has to be just so, just so yeah. documentary you can put in your pictures you can get some stuff on your like documentary is a medium that gives you more space I like more space, and as a new creative, I need more space mm. to learn and mess up and, and you know, yeah. Okay. Um, about filmmaking, this is a question that only Miss Laura can ask because she is an expert. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Where do you think the state of filmmaking is today? And, cause I, and I know you've probably seen different stages of it. Mm. I think the state of filmmaking is like the state of hip hop. Because it has the potential to earn a lot of money, the people in power have put their hand on it. And that hand will convolute the creativity. And it doesn't allow people to tell a true, authentic, raw, uncut story. Mm. So I believe that the direction of filmmaking real filmmaking resides in the hands of independent filmmakers. Mm. We've, we haven't been touched by the big hand. And so we play by our own rules. We tell raw stories and we get our audience to come in. Like hip hop, unsigned artists, they the best, they got the best bars. Man, unsigned artists, man, they giving it to you all the way. Like I'm a hip hop head. But these cats, man, I don't mess with these cats, man. I, man, I don't even understand, for real. So I, I feel like um, the independent filmmaking, unsigned artists, that's what you should be looking for. That's what you should be listening to. That's where you're going to get stuff that you can really feel like in your, in your soul. Mm -hmm. And for the other stuff in the mainstream stuff, it is what it is. It's spinning a narrative. It wants you to buy. It wants you to obey. It wants you to believe wants things. You to put in that subscription every month. Yeah, to, to fit in that box. So that is what it is. But I believe independent is where it's at. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do some follow-up questions. These questions are more so for me personally. Um, and it's more so about for the young audience. Or I'm not going to say young audience because I am the young audience. Okay. Um, what what advice do you have for those key independent filmmakers that 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 uh, you know runs the state of the filmmaker world, like you said? Young young independent filmmakers, you're gonna. Well, for me, so let me talk about me. I did not understand until I started doing it that I could do it without anybody. Because you don't know and you're learning, you want to connect to internal. When you start to work on what is internal, then that you're making it external. As long as you work towards your craft, you're going to get further and further towards your goal, right? So that's what I would tell them. Do not get twisted in the wind about who don't want to work with you, who didn't answer the phone, or who's doing this or who's doing that. Because the minute you do that, you are outside of your gift. Stay in the pocket with
tough question. You know, as you can see, I'm in a relationship. Um, give us some advice about love. What should we do going forward? That's a whole nother show, man. That's that's a whole nother show. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't born 58. I understand that little Kim was the Megan Thee Stallion of my time. I understand all of that. This ratchetness and this disrespect for yourselves and disrespect for each other, and y'all don't want, you know, I, I think that WAP song that was the most disgusting song I ever heard in my life. Mm. She says, I don't, how I got, I don't cook, I don't clean. That's how I got this ring. What? What? Like, what? But you got a whole husband, right? Meeting women that that really, your, your hair is false, your eyelashes is false. Every day you got on, make, like, yo, yo. You know, you don't want a brother that got a regular, smegular job. No, somebody gotta be like I don't I don't boo I ain't got an answer for that I really and I, I I'm long on answers mm -hmm. I'm long on answers but it goes back to what I said searching for either one outside of yourself mm. we have everything we need inside of us but we are always outside of ourselves I'm very proud of you and your boo. Hey, boo. Hey, boo. I'm very proud of the way you treat each other. And the respect that you have for each other. Um, I don't know. I'm going to pray for you babies, man. I don't know what to say about this relationship. It is, man, ratchet. I, I don't know. I believe you. I can say the same thing for myself. Now that you say it, I feel more right. I don't know what to say. I have a grandson. He's 20 years old. I always say, hey, grandson, how do, how do ladies treat you? <sighs> Nana. <laughs> Nana. And he says, and I don't mind taking them out, you know, but I want somebody to get to know me, you know. He said, Nana, I don't understand how if I'm dating somebody that they feel is all right to ask me to buy them a pocketbook or a pair of shoes or a... So... Hey, I don't know. I would say this to the brothers. Brothers, do not allow a woman with fake hair, fake nails, and fake eyelashes to tell you that you ain't on it because you can't buy her a $400 so-and-so. Mm. $400 so-and-so? Oh, my goodness. Okay? Sisters, they got a good job. You going to college. You handling your business. Got the t-shirt and the cap. Damn. You know, so is about locking in and i think that we've come back to this a lot so you know it's a god thing because god when god gives you something you can talk about a million things but that thing that he gave you will be relevant in everything that you talk about mm -hmm. like that's a god thing and it is about being in tune with yourself in a loud noisy distracting world you have everything you need to be successful inside of you that's how he could everybody i ain't special I'm not special. Trust me. What he gave me, he gave everybody. He not a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. That was powerful. Okay. Last question of the day. Um, give us give us something that us young people should start doing now and tomorrow. I, know, I already know one of them is to start eating sea moss. S start eating sea moss. Take your black seed oil, but stop eating carry out.
second thing is the gadgets, the gadgets, the phone, the social media. Start testing yourself and see how much time you spend on it. Test that up against you saying what you don't have time for. We're going to do a little test of the emergency broadcast system. I guarantee you, anything that you aspire to do, that you say you ain't got time to do it, cut down on your social media, and I promise you, you'll start getting some stuff done. That's all I got. That's what those two right there. Watch what you eat, and watch them ringing and the pinging and the zinging and the liking and the ooh and the watch the me and the butt butt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on that note, this has been the number one podcast on the ISA. We have just interviewed Miss Laura, the Soul Right Porn Expert. And I'm excited for the future. I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. Whitey, thank you so much for having me. I love you guys. We love you too. <laughs> Until next time.